I titled my talk Museum as Community uh, because really as a cultural anthropologist working with living people and communities and history, I find that history and um, heritage is everywhere. And the cemeteries are one of those types of sites. And so thinking about museum not as a physical location that you have to make an effort just to go to and see what's housed in there, to look all around where we are and understand that museums are our cultural legacy and oftentimes they've been overlooked, particularly with uh, black communities and marginalized communities. So really putting that energy around thinking about uh, what it is to be a museum. And so uh, those are the kinds of things I'm gonna pretty much highlight uh, as I go through my talk. And so I found it fitting that uh, Dr. Blakey started out with what is that issue or the things that he talked about got to my question, what is that issue? What is at stake? Particularly in Florida and all over the country as we know. Our basic humanity, it is that we are human, black folk and other folk who are outside, uh, as Dr. Blakey was stating, outside the, the European paradigm. It's a fight for humanity. It's a fight to justify, and we shouldn't have to do it anyways. But it, what's at stake? Simply our humanity. Simply humanity. So when we think about why I'm doing this, why all of us are here, um, it is to, 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 to solidify that, to talk about that, to figure out what we need to do to continue, as our ancestors have been doing, to um, you know, just maintain uh, this knowledge and bring it forth. And as I said, one of the things I learned from Dr. Blakey early on when I started, um, oh, I forgot, <laughs> doing this work was <laughs> uh, he gave a talk once at University of South Florida. And one of the things that stuck out for me from that talk was that, as he mentioned this morning, burying and memorializing our dead is our most basic act of being human. And so when I began working on cemetery projects, particularly with the Dozier School for Boys project, is what Dr. Blakey came in to consult with us and work with us on at University of South Florida. Now, the Dozier School for Boys was a, um, a reform school uh, in Mariana, Florida, up around the Tallahassee area, in which had dis disproportionately, as you would imagine, uh, marginalized, underrepresented people, uh, black folk, in that reform school who were often there because of not, no major reason, truancy, um, vagrancy, any of those kinds of things. But these were young kids up through, uh, from anywhere from six to 18 years old that were kept there. And also they had a cemetery where many of these boys were, um, you know, buried or <laughs> uh, after having died from various reasons. And so one of the things my colleagues and I were doing was one of the things, one was a forensic anthropologist, a bioarchaeologist, and I, a cultural anthropologist, was trying to understand and put some, um, first of all, draw attention to this and get some remedy for people who were buried in that Boot Hill Cemetery, but also understand all of the reasons why this was uh, the case. And we invited Dr. Blakey to come down. And he quantified all of this for me when I, when he, when I heard him say uh, our basic humanity uh, is the fact that we bury our dead. And I've been carrying this thought and this idea with me as a, a way again to, to get back to my original question, what is at stake, our basic humanity? So cemeteries are the fundamental, why are we having all these fights and all these erasures of black cemeteries? Uh, it goes back to the erasure of the simple rec erasure of their humanity and the failure to recognize that humanity um, by those folk. But on the flip side, black people have recognized their humanity and knew that and celebrated it and all those kinds of things that we saw in the ceremony this morning. That's not something that individual black folk challenges, whether they're human or not. That was already known. And as researchers, I think we need to think about it. And this, as, we, as I go along, you'll see, this has been challenged for me because sometimes we enter the research profession or the atmosphere with trying to work from that paradigm of we are not human or this thing has to be proven as opposed to uh, preserving what I call preserving with uh, 
intention. Um, oh, I have my thing. Uh, one of the ways we're doing this is preserving with intention. And preserving with intention means that we're recognizing, not we're just preserving the past at some static testament of what history was and the remnants with the uh, maybe uh, the, the big house and the, uh, the cabins and all those kinds of things. But we're preserving with intention, meaning we're preserving with the future in mind. What is it that we want to tell? What is it that has been left out of history and why? And thinking about doing that as we don't go about our preservation work, and that has been the challenge with me too, is to preserve it not with the past in mind, but with the future in mind. Preservation with an intention to work on those gaps uh, and, and do that um, you know, with a vengeance. So that, that was one of the, the, the other key things. And how do you do this? And I'm not gonna say things that probably all of, like I said, individually and on various projects and ways that you all, all are working, because I know I'm talking to a very knowledgeable audience, an active audience. But I wanna put frameworks around what this means. And so preserving um, with intention looks like revisiting the kinds of things, the infrastructure in which those things you have to grapple with and understand with a nuance in order to bring that vision forward. So oftentimes we're dealing with issues of silence, erasure, and absence. And those are the kinds of things that you have to uh, break apart and think about more critically. Um, often when we hear about black cemeteries, you know, sometimes they're abandoned. That, that is a very loose term sometimes for what actually happened. Um, and so we need to think about what does abandoned mean? What does it mean if they're lost? They're not lost. Lost can, an abandonment could be embodied in understanding these type, this type of framework. So if you break that down a little bit further, um, in my first book, I was talking about what, is, what it means to have knowledge silenced, subjugated knowledge. Again, this comes from the understanding that the knowledge contained within uh, plantation spaces, plantation communities, people con associated with plantations, uh, black people I'm talking about, and the people, that, the, the people who did the majority of the work on those plantations, have been subjugated. They, it has been particularly not spoken about. <laughs> it's not that it wasn't there. It's not, not that it's not there. So subjugated knowledge is knowledge. It is a form of knowledge that we are elevating now, shining a light on and bringing forward. So if you speak from that position, as Dr. Blakey was saying, descended communities have that type of knowledge that has often been ignored. And then by ignoring it, then you erase it <laughs> from the textbooks, the, the ways that we know. So subjugated knowledge means putting the emphasis on those things that African people, uh, descended communities, have been passing on through generations. Uh, knowledge is through their everyday act of living, I call it, just simply surviving. As I said, simply getting from DC to here, just getting here, getting there to the next day is an act, an everyday act of living. And oftentimes that is not documented and it's not given its proper space in those dialogues that we talk about when we talk about um, enslaved Africans or descended people and communities from these spaces that have often been marginalized. The space has been marginalized. The communities and the people associated with it are knowledge bearers. And so we think about thinking about it from that way. One of the plantations that I worked on was uh, Jahasi Island, which is a rice plantation in, uh, right outside of Charleston. And one of the, one of the quotes uh, from that uh, plantation is like, you go and read the brochures and home to a large plantations owned by a small number of individuals who manage their wetlands uh, um, primarily to grow rice. So what is, <laughs> it's a lot left out in that. You know, it's a lot left out. If you go just like here, you go to see the size of Jahasi Island rice plantation and the sheer amount of work and knowledge and labor and everything that went into maintaining that space, you know that that sentence alone does not cover all of the things that people were doing. And this also drove me to, 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 like, to, to, to break apart how we get to these silences, these erasures 
It's in these kinds of brochures and the things we say. As I tell my students, you have to be deliberate in how you word these kinds of things and, and dissecting because we are called now to write these types of uh, uh, pamphlets and these types of things that are found on uh, waysides and things like that. So really need to be critical in doing that. And then this other piece, when we talk about um, absence and exclusion and erasure, is what I called in my new book, Active Exclusion. And what I found in, in leisure studies, primarily, was where, where I entered into this conversation and I was thinking about uh, places, segregated spaces that are called, like spaces of leisure, amusement parks, um, uh, hospitality places and things like that. Parks, national parks, which is one of my primary things I talk about in the book. They were like, they're now, which galled me was, now they're asking, people ask, why aren't there any black people coming to this park? As if the problem <laughs> is, the, is, the people are, is the people that are not coming. <laughs> so once again, you become the problem. You're the problem because you were excluded from the spot. And then now, fast forward, there, people are trying to think about and, and strategize about how do we get these people to come to the park? It must be some innate biological reason or that they cannot come and appreciate a park or they don't want to swim, they don't want to get wet, they don't like nature, whatever, don't like nature. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> I started saying, no, 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 that discrimination theory that, oh, well, they just, you know, slight something, you know, one time they got discriminated against so they're not coming. No. You have to understand you did a, a whole campaign for some of these parks to tell black people not to come here. And if you do come, you go stay over there somewhere. We have your little section, stay over there. You know? So you have to examine the, the thing that created this, this, this uh, the fact that there are no black people in certain things like, uh, there's things like Mammoth Cave. Oh, there are no black people at caving, doing caving. Black people created caving in, the, in that region. They were like the four forebears of that. But that story is erased, and then it didn't say what the Park Service did in that particular case with Mammoth Cave to totally, when the Park Service took over, they said, no more black cave guides. <laughs> and, and, you know, thanks and no thanks. And they totally disrupted uh, the history of, of the things that were going on in that park. And, and it wasn't until fast forward again, you know, that people were asking, like, we, want, we now want to diversify these parks and all these things, uh, you know, again, strategizing as to why. So, again, thinking about highlighting in these three instances what this notion of absence, erasure, and um, silence really means. So as we do our work, Keep those frameworks in mind because it really helps uh, as, we, um, as we go about trying to, to make changes and to create the future. Again, we're talking preservation for the future with the future in mind. Um, one of the things I also learned, like I said, was that everyday acts of living are defense against exploitation, erasure, and fixed ideas. And the very fact, again, that um, the reason we are here is because people before us it did those day-to-day -day things that you need to do uh, to keep on living despite, in spite of all the things that were coming, the horrors, as Dr. Blakey had underscored this morning. Uh, and no one's, you know, diluting the fact that it was horrible. But in the face of that, because of the very humanity, and the same thing with the, the segre uh, segregated spaces, uh, black people did not not do park things. They just did them in the places where it was out of sight of white people, or white people didn't care about it until they figured maybe that space or land was valuable. But they were not not doing these things. So the flip side is, black people have continued to maintain these sacred spaces, cemeteries, um, and other um, church spaces, and those kinds of things or leisure spaces, or always, anywhere you go, you can probably find that black people are doing that, have done it, but you have to do the extra uh, effort to reach out to those communities and find out what. 
Uh, so I have, oftentimes they're saying black people didn't do something only because they didn't do it in the white venue. And the white venue they couldn't do it in because they were oftentimes excluded. So it's a, it's a circular thing. But everyday acts of living is what really, another thing that really formed the way uh, I became engaged in, in this, these kinds of conversations. And one of the, the people that did that for me was Miss Maddie Gilliard. Miss Maddie Gilliard was, uh, when I started my research uh, uh, in the University of South Florida, I I'm a, uh, was working on rice plantation and looking at descendant communities along uh, the southeast coast, the Gullah, primarily the Gullah Geechee region where descendants of enslaved Africans who worked on rice plantations. And uh, so I, I was researching plantations up and down the southeast coast of the U.S. And one particular place, uh, when I very first started, I realized first that um, A, I had a very, uh, you know, understanding of plantations that I wouldn't want to go. I, they were negative, what are you going to learn from these spaces? Why, do, why really do this research? But then I started learning about rice agriculture, and I understood that black folk were the tech, they understood this technology and really brought that to the southeast coast uh, were, uh, were enslaved because from regions that were rice growing region, regions of West Africa to, to because of that skill. So the flip side of understanding that black folk brought this type of knowledge, uh, technological knowledge, because you see my background is also computer science and technical too, that I was, it, 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 it shifted the way I was thinking about what happened on plantations. I really didn't think of it as uh, people bringing knowledge to that space. So uh, one of the first places I did research was uh, in Mount Pleasant, Boone Hall Plantation, and then Snee Farm Plantation, was, which was a, 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 ri a rice plantation as well. Uh, and I went down there still, even though, again, I understood the technological knowledge that people had around, like, that the Africans brought with them regarding rice, I still had this fixed idea about, oh man, uh, plantations are totally negative, what can we learn? I'm just gonna go down here, talk to these people, and just kind of put this kind of sad <laughs> monologue together about, man, they just suffered through uh, this enslavement with whatever. I just really had just all these kinds of connotations built in. And when I met Miss Maddie, <laughs> She was one of the first people, early people that I interviewed, and she, I saw these cabins, and I just, like I said, they were, they didn't mean anything. And they, I mean, they meant negative things to me. And that, not that, not that I think there's any glory days in a <laughs> plantation cabin, but I'm just saying that is all I saw. And this Miss Maddie quantified that because she was like, this was her home. This is, she, she cast it as home, again, Humanity, you have home, you have family, you have, uh, you know, connections, you're learning, you you know, engaging with people and each other, uh, communicating knowledge, uh, they were, um, they had to do, they, she passed down, you know, the basket sewing uh, to her daughter and grandkids and those kinds of things. So these kinds of intergenerational knowledges that were being passed down, this type of knowledge of the whole running and operation of the plantation that Miss Maddie had, based on the fact that her mother and her grandmother were cooks. Um, and then <laughs> I just learned how to interview people uh, around these kinds of things. Because again, I went down there at first talking about, what do you think about slavery? Nobody wants to talk about that. Like that, like, you know, just hit me with, what do you think, what do you think I think? Uh, <laughs> so she taught me again how to, how to ask questions. like. What is home? Why is that home? What does home mean? What does it mean uh, to cook? Uh, what kind of recipes? Uh, how did they get handed down? In the history of that, I learned, uh, you know, the fact that, um, you know, going back uh, through slavery for her um, family, I could hear those stories through what she was telling me about cooking, about home, about how she came to maybe own the property that she uh, owns now. Uh, and those kinds of things. And she also dispelled the notion of, not that people weren't sharecroppers, but one of the stories that came out of these conversations with many people in Mount Pleasant was 
when they found out I was doing research, they said, tell them we, weren't share, we were not sharecroppers. In this particular community, I'm not saying that sharecropping was not uh, a thing that people did uh, in many places, but in this particular, having a monolithic story about a community based on just generalized knowledge of, of these sites, that was dispelled for me with Ms. Maddie because again, she was telling me about how her family came to own uh, uh, the house where she lives now, or lived, she's since deceased, uh, and how she was able to buy the property. And she was living, and when, this is another thing, when the, the census records or those people come to collect who is, who's landowner, who's not, she said she lived in those plantation houses long after, you know, of course she was beyond uh, past slavery, but, um, but she was still living in that until she got married in her 30, 30s or something like that, 29, 30. And, but people didn't know that she had another house. She lived there for convenience because she worked uh, uh, for pay on that plantation, but in the uh, weekends and things like that, family, family gatherings, she went uh, to her house. So the, it's the, 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 comp, the capturing of uh, multiple roles are not done or shown or things that you have to think about when you're cap working on this type of history. It's not one single role. People often have multiple identity, uh, all, multiple ways they were relating, and then multiple roles and put, fit into multiple categories. So again, Miss Maddie taught me, again, how to, to ask questions, how to um, um, engage with people, and the power of agency. Again, the power of her knowing her place and her role within her family, her church, her civic organizations, and being able to, to quantify that and tell me and qualify that. Uh, and then seeing her as a knowledge source because when people were trying to do the history of the Snee Farm Plantation and Boone Hall Plantation, they would consult with Miss Maddie because she was the person with the, old, the most amount of information about where things used to be on that plantation, plantation or what they were used for. Uh, and so I watched that in action as well. So it just, it just gave me a whole nother understanding and respect for thinking about the basic humanity of people as opposed to the basic label that was placed on what their roles were. And so seeing that from the ground up was very important. So that was one thing I learned, uh, from, or several things that I learned from Ms. Maddie. Uh, about the everyday acts of living, learning about a community by being in community. I, going to church services, going to family reunions, going to barbecues, going to things that were important to people in that community, and in the process, learning the history and the other things that were important, and then framing the work on things that were important to that community uh, from that perspective, as opposed to the the, the narrow guidelines of which we are often defending against. Uh, so becoming a little bit more, I think, on the, if you want to use those kinds of uh, offense, like proactively showing, starting from the starting point, that these communities are uh, knowledge source, nor uh, knowledgeable, and have been subjugated uh, in, those, in, the, in the way they've been framed and utilized in, in these um, spaces in which we often operate. The other thing, if we want to think about a framework for um, moving forward, uh, is thinking about um, where to start. It's so big, right? Is there so much to do? So, so, so much uh, ground to cover. And as as many of you who are laboring on this right now, no, just start where you are. If you just look around, there are things that can be done. Things that have been erased, silenced, made, um, are absent from the dialogue, the, com uh, the communication, the way things you know about your, your own place, your own town, by starting local. If you don't see black people in the story, then you need to probably go ahead and start doing some investigation. Really, because at what I find that there is, you just start doing your research and you will find that, again, museum and community, people, descendant knowledge, black cemeteries in the area will tell you who were the laborers, who built that place in the first place, who were those people who you know, were there from the very beginning, uh, if their cemeteries are, in fact, still um, standing. 
But that's the importance of the cemetery uh, for me, is that I spent a lot of time in the cemeteries learning family names, learning, you know, play, uh, getting uh, knowledge on who I should probably talk to and looking at the connections based on the cemetery. So the cemetery itself is a wealth of knowledge, not, not just the fact of working on the issue of erasure of cemeteries, just the fair, sheer fact that the cemetery is one of those spaces within uh, black communities or with a focus uh, on telling the story of black communities because they had so many um, implications. There's so many implications about who a town, who that place, who that space belongs to, or who built it. And so the founding members of the community are often the whole community. I'm not just talking this to, at this point about black people. I'm talking about for whatever town, Tampa. You can learn who the founding families were who really built the community up from the, the ground up. Who did all the labor, the seamstress work, the artisan work. It's often found in black communities. That's another reason to, you know, you know, try to silence that kind of uh, history or that, that resource as, a, or as a, a space, a sacred space. So one of the ways that I and my team was starting local in this particular type of discussion was the starting of what we call the, and, and, and it's a nod to Dr. Blakey's work with the African Burial Ground Project, but it's called the African American Burial Ground Project, in which in Tampa Bay area, following the, um, the killing of George Floyd, the University of South Florida and many institutions in the, around the country and in the area were, you know, figured out wh what, can, what can we do to better connect with the communities that are important to us or that we want to have a better uh, communication with. And uh, one of the things that they did was issue a call to action uh, and had a $500,000 grant that they opened up and had uh, people bid on uh, or put in proposals for, for projects. And they then picked about 19 or 20 projects. And one of the projects I put in for that was to, to do the African, what we call the African American Burial Ground and Remembering Project. Because at that same time, uh, around 2018, 2019, um, reporters had been doing work finding these uh, African uh, American burial grounds, places underneath housing complexes underneath parking lots, underneath stadiums, and all those kinds of things. All of that kept coming out in the news. And so these reporters uh, were doing this kind of work and raising the, raising the awareness that you know, they, they, these was a, this was a problem. And one of the cemeteries uh, in there uh, was Zion Cemetery. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But that cemetery was one that really crystallized for me that this project would be important. And why I thought, why my team and why the kind of perspective our team would bring, perspective our team would bring to this conversation was because we did, as a multidiscipline, uh, multi-campus, uh, staff, uh, artisans, we work with artists and uh, researchers, and we just put together a really broad coalition of people to work on this, on this uh, African American Burial Ground project. And what I had seen missing from that, or what I wanted to know more about, when I was listening to mostly the archaeologists were there, had really found, uh, did um, uh, ground penetrating radar, and they had confirmed that underneath the housing complex, and I'll get to it again, that there, there were actually cemeteries there. But what was happening was the focus was mostly on the, again, that site. And I wanted to know what about the community, the living people and communities that A, were living around there, or uh, the histories of the communities that uh, established that cemetery in the first place, and then what we're going to do going forward. Like, what are we going to do going forward? Besides, really, you do need that kind of, in many cases, although I agree with Dr. Blakey, don't give up on those oral histories, because that really puts the, 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 the context and answers a lot of questions that just that ground penetrating radar and those, those kinds of you know, technical uh, uh, resources cannot do. And so I didn't hear that, and I wanted to have a, a place where we would have that kind of conversation. And so I um, established this team to do that kind of work, to do that kind of understanding of the broader community uh, and, 
and what they could bring to the story. Again, the reason why this is important, Zion Cemetery was one of the first ones in the Tampa Bay area, uh, which got really a lot of pub pub publicity because there were over, it ends up over 700 people buried in what they called um, Zion, what was Zion Cemetery, established by a, 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 a black man who was a millionaire, uh, and he, you know, established a cemetery, and uh, so for longest, it was established in a, in a what was a, originally Robles um, Village, which was originally a black community. It was a black community because black folk created a space where, you know, they, they figured that land, or the, that land was one, uh, at one point was in an area, I guess, that wasn't, the city didn't find valuable. Uh, and so black folk really had, uh, you know, had that space to, to, to create community and all those kinds of things. So the Robles Park uh, village at that one, or the Robles Park um, community at that point started out as a black community. So in that area, therefore, there were cemeteries, churches, businesses, all these kinds of things historically. Uh, then fast forward into the kinds of things that I was talking about for um, tourism, for, uh, for uh, Zion. Uh, Robles Park became, with the tourist boom in Florida, that land where these black folk had, <laughs> had established their community suddenly became very valuable for other reasons. And so uh, one of the things was Florida wanted to attract all these tourists, uh, and so they, um, you know, through eminent domain and all kinds of things, suddenly, you know, lost tax records, lost records that this was a cemetery, all the kinds of things, overtaxing uh, the cemetery and uh, in, in running up these charges for taxes. The cemetery changed hands, the records are lost. Suddenly, things suddenly got very muddy around what was there in that site. Uh, and it turned into Robles Park Housing Complex, which was, was one of a premier housing um, complexes for white tours, or white folk who came down from the north. At one point, Robles was marketed as that, Robles Park. And so they, were, they built this uh, you know, housing complex, segregated at the time, only white folks only for this one, uh, over top of the area where the cemetery was, again, because like I said, suddenly no one remembered or knew that there was a cemetery. When they did, uh, get confronted about it because when they started the construction day one, they found some bodies, and it's on the it's in the new, newspaper articles capture the fact that they found these bodies. Uh, I think they were like young kids or something. The city goes, oh yeah, this is again. Think about the the sequence I'm telling you because you, as we talk about more and more cemeteries, this is a kind of projection that happens. Oh. Those are, we moved everything else. Those are just, those were just, uh, we, those are anomaly. Okay, we'll you know, recognize that, but we keep going. They kept going. They built the housing complex anyways. <laughs> and said they had moved all the other bodies. Suddenly they remembered there was a cemetery, but meanwhile they had moved all the bodies and they had sold it, I guess, to this, these uh, private landowners. Uh, and they, again, eventually they went ahead and built it Fast forward, Robles Park housing complex is now a predominantly black, uh, uh, low-income uh, housing uh, complex. Um, and this, again, reporters started doing, uh, you know, discussions on what, who, what, was, what was at that site originally because now the city, once again, it changed hands from an all-white segregated uh, complex then it, uh, over time, became a, the, 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 the feds brought it and it became a federal housing uh, complex for um, low income. And then now it's about to go through redevelopment again. And so this prompted all of these new discussions again about, you know, what's there, who's, you know, you know what are we going to do with that site going forward? And so people finally, uh, because of the pressures for some of the things that the newspaper reporters were saying, and then all the kinds of momentum that was building up for, um, um, you know, the focus people were having on this site, uh, and the NAACP and everybody, uh, they called, they asked, they asked them to do a, a GPR, ground penetrating radar, on 
Some had tore down, I think, one or two of the buildings, right, to, just to confirm, because their records had said that there were some burials there. So they fast forward, they did find, again, as they're you know, planning to do redevelopment, that yes, indeed, there are, it is a cemetery, the bodies still remain, uh, and they're relocating all the people from the housing complex anyways to, for redevelopment, but um, um, again, it was that erasure of that knowledge, uh, and it was that pressure again from reporters and the, the, the kind of work now that's happening within the communities, all the other communities and areas, the work that the African American Burial Ground Project is doing around keep asking these questions. We started interviewing people who lived in the Robles Park complex about you know their experiences because they said that they you know would hear ghosts and all these kinds of things, and then other people who lived around there had test, testified and also gave oral histories that they saw. Um, they knew that that was a cemetery in, in the past. So um, again, the, comp the complexities of those kinds of things, that these cemeteries become erased for various reasons, and it's that um, focus from um, outside community uh, groups or outside um, the, the governmental agencies and those kinds of things, putting pressure on the government putting pressure, pressure on these institutes, uh, institutions to do something. And it's the same that happened in St. Petersburg, Florida. There is a, uh, where Tropicana Field is, where there is a, um, there's a baseball stadium over top of what it's now, or at least a parking lot of the baseball stadium is over top of a cemetery. And then the highways in St. Petersburg, or I'll show you that in a second, are over top of those areas. This, this is a comp picture of the Robles Park, Park housing complex. Those are the housing structures, and in that, in all of there, there's, there's burials. Uh, and they did some of the ground penetrating radar work in there, and they put it back uh, in that middle part, and they found that there were actual graves. And then there are old historic maps existed that there was a cemetery, I mean, all the stuff that you can actually easily find if you want to. And then, like I said, in St. Petersburg, Florida, there is a similar type of erasure with three of the cemeteries, Oakland, Evergreen, and Moffitt. And these are all the cemeteries that my uh, African American Burial Ground project team and I are working on, working on the oral histories, working on learning about the communities that ex lived or existed historically at the time those cemeteries were uh, active. Uh, and it was the gas plant district, which is now downtown St. Petersburg. Uh, which, and part of it is parking lot, and part of it is downtown St. Petersburg where the gas plant district was, which was all black, uh, historically African American community, uh, which is, you know, now been basically erased uh, from the landscape at least, not, not, not the cultural um, people who are associated with that know exactly what was there, who was buried there, or who lived and worked in those places, so telling those stories of some of the things that we're doing. And then there's three cemeteries that are underneath, um, partly underneath the parking lot and partly underneath the highways. And so those are the kinds of stories and communities that we, with the African American Project, Burial Ground Project, are working to collect the oral histories, work to inform people about the fact that these places are, did exist and they are being, had been, have been erased. And as they go into, re, as they go into uh, development in the future, what are you going to do about, you know, making sure this, this is accounted for and that it doesn't happen again, which is one of the big drivers uh, of the project. And so these are just four cemeteries who kind of tell the story of many of the other cemeteries in, in the cemetery in Clearwater underneath the parking lot. Um, so just goes on and on. So these cemeteries have literally been erased by being built over, let alone erased in the fact that people don't talk about the history and heritage within those sites. So that's the kind of work we're doing to, to, to counter that. One of the ways we do it, I don't know if you can, it's, it's too, it's not uh, loud enough, but this is the underpass of the highway. So we were standing in the parking lot, uh, uh, doing, you know, starting kicking off our research just to kind of get a bearing for the site, but under here, we just, I just taped the sound of the traffic 
And you would hear, uh, if you had this PowerPoint and it was uh, or a smaller venue, you probably could hear the sound of the traffic just flying over top of this overpass and over top of this cemetery and nobody even knowing. Just kind of saying sometimes you also engage with listening. Listening is a very important part of knowing what's going on at the site. So a way to engage uh, people's knowledge of that site is through just generally just stopping and listening to what's going on or not going on. Uh, and so that's one of the things we also learned as part of the work we're doing with the project. And the output from this project so far, we have an oral history database that's on public record on, uh, at the University of South Florida. You can just dial into African American Burial Ground Project. Here, uh, lots of the oral histories. I think we have like 12 out there. and We're still actively going, uh, building on that database. There's a story map that tells graphically the story, some of the story that I'm talking about. And then it's a big section called Artists uh, uh, and Their Work. And they, we had artists working with their spoken word poets, um, visual artists that have interpreted some of the histories from listening to the oral histories, reading some of the genealogical research that's been done, uh, and some of the other archival work, and then re reinterpreting that in an artistic form. So to engage the engage the public in a whole different way in understanding what these sites mean. So all of that is out there on that site if you really want to see in context how to bring this, these stories alive and really help people to connect and understand what's going on and reach a lot of multiple audiences. And so the biggest contribution I think is I really appreciate the artists work that they've done with that site. And then fast forward again to just thinking about um, issues of preservation and what that means. So reimagining uh, preservation. One of the ways to do that, again, is how do you think for the future? How do you preserve with the future in mind? How do you make things accessible to a larger or broader uh, population? One of the things, as I was working on the African American Burial Ground Project, I quickly understood that this was, the things I'm telling you are, were not an isolated story. It's not just in Tampa, it's just not in uh, St. Pete or Clearwater or wherever, it's all over. And so how do we connect those stories, those histories, those concerns that many of you are working on, on a, on a national, put it in a national conversation so it's not seen as one, an, again, not used as an isolated incident and just uh, brushed off. So creating the Black Cemetery Network was a way to be able to talk about these cemeteries and these stories and these histories just like I kind of outlined just for the ones I was talking about, but how does that look all over the country where people are battling and doing the similar things and what can we learn about black people, black history, black communities, the history of the U America uh, through learning about the cemeteries and having that network where people submit their sites to the Black Cemetery Network and submit their stories, commit, submit the types of work that they're doing uh, to this network. It's easy to do and I'm asking, I know a lot of you out here are working on cemeteries. You'll go out to the website and if afterwards I have these cards, blackcemeterynetwork.org, just go out there, you'll see a beautiful website. And right now we started with like 13, 12 or 13 sites. We're up to like 105 or more now uh, where people register their site with the Black Cemetery Network and you know, put their story in national conversation. And then also, you know, I, I you know, go and help answer questions about how to help coordinate some of the things that people need to do to get their, you know, cemetery site um, preserved or fight uh, for, you know, uh, fight legislation or, or, you know, create ordinances or, or do something that to, to help them. So it's, it varies. People call for all kinds of different other reasons. But the biggest reason right now is to put this, use this as a voice uh, when people see that this is like happening everywhere and you can learn people as members of the site also learn uh, from each other uh, and what's going on and how they're doing things and, and, and so it's an um, interactive uh, kind of site and it's a, all these sites listed on here people are really particularly actively or engaged in doing some in some degree doing some aspect of preservation or memorialization uh, with regard to those sites. Um, just last couple weeks ago, I was in um, Cincinnati, and uh, I went to uh, the Union uh, Baptist Cemetery, which is uh, the Union Baptist Church is the second oldest black church in Cincinnati, and therefore, 
you know, they were in, they were in a battle with uh, one of the, the cemeteries that are connected that they um, manage, Union United Colored Af American Cemetery, and Fifth Third Bank, National Bank, had uh, has their head world headquarters above, just located above uh, where the cemetery is, and their parking lot uh, is is elevated, it's on a hill, and they've let groundwater, sewage run down on the cemetery. And so now the cemetery, the black cemetery folk in the church and everybody is trying to fight to get them to, to, to help restore and admit to the fact that the, the way they had uh, organized their piping and all that kind of thing, it was onto that cemetery. So they're in a fight with the <laughs> Fifth Third Bank with all the money and resources they could partner and really make, uh, make some significant uh, contributions to to this, but they are rather fight with the church about you know whether or not they caused the damage, and so they're spending all these resources in court, making this small entity prove that they you know that the headquarters was the the source of the problem. So I was there working with them, and that's also they want to do some of the oral history, oral histories and work, do some work with their archive and maintain some of the archives they had. So they're really just working with them and trying to connect them with resources and, 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 and just so, show what the Black Cemetery Network could do in terms of uh, advocacy and being there, being present with them. Uh, so the, as we end this, uh, countering Black Cemetery erasure is a, is a goal of all of this. And it's to build inclusive futures, meaning what kind of thing do we want to bring forward? So moving from those areas that I had uh, highlighted as you know, problems or things that we should be critiquing to something uh, that is more um, active. And so um, all of us here are responsible for telling, uh, you know, bringing forward this knowledge and looking at it with the idea, as I said before, that black cemeteries and black folk and the knowledge they share are essentially already an asset already is not something we need to prove. We need to look look at it from their terms forward and bring that as the, the, the foundational uh, way of creating um, new stories and creating new resources. Uh, and then you know using re research and advocacy as our as our tools. So um, so in in conclusion, really the unity and the collaboration and the strength we get by working together. Uh, is what the Black Cemetery Network is about and what the kinds of work that all of us are doing are about. And those kinds of things is, is uh, power in numbers and each of the things that we, we know are, uh, that we bring to the table are significant. And again, like I said, I can't under, uh, um, overstate the fact that we really just have to start with knowing that the things, the knowledge, the power, uh, the agency that many of these what we so-called marginalized communities bring are the solutions that we are <laughs> looking for now. Those communities have done that, kept those things really a lot. That, that's what kept them moving forward in many cases. And so finding that kind of knowledge and making that central, making that central uh, as opposed to try to fit them into the ways of, that we already have looking at that as a foundational knowledge for what we should build from. And that's what I've been learning all the time from working with uh, all these uh, communities and, and these projects, particularly the cemetery project. So I just want to thank all of you all for taking the time to listen to me. And I really hope to get more people involved around the Black Cemetery Network and you know hear about all the kinds of work that you all are doing in community, uh, because there's so much knowledge uh, like I said, in these individual spaces that we really need to bring forward. And so I thank you for your time.